It's the Popori Show. A comforting quarter of an hour of reflection, nostalgia and encouragement. An alternative to Zumba and quantitative easing. With a soup song of humour and spiritual uplift. Henry Nguyen, whose short life was characterised by a deep commitment to Jesus Christ, tells of a very moving personal experience. Nguyen, as some might not know, was a distinguished scholar, having taught at the University of Notre Dame and at Harvard University. He gave it all up to work with the mentally retarded at a centre in Toronto. In his book, The Return of the Prodigal Son, he brings to life one of Rembrandt's paintings. He had been profoundly affected by Rembrandt's depiction of the prodigal son returning to the waiting father in whose arms he was clasped. Nguyen journeyed to see the original painting and admitted to being apprehensive lest the work be less than what his imagination suggested. This is how he words the impact after sitting in front of the painting for four hours. And so there I was, facing the painting that had been on my mind and in my heart for nearly three years. I was stunned by its majestic beauty, its size larger than life, its abundant reds, browns and yellows, its shadowy recess and bright foreground, but most of all the light enveloped embrace of father and son surrounded by four mysterious bystanders. All of this gripped me with an intensity far beyond my anticipation. There had been moments in which I had wondered whether the real painting might disappoint me. The opposite was true. Its grandeur and splendour made everything recede into the background and held me completely captivated. Rembrandt's embrace remained imprinted on my soul far more profoundly than any temporary expression of emotional support. It has brought me into touch with something within me that lies far beyond the ups and downs of life, something that represents the ongoing yearning of the human spirit, the yearning for a final return, an unambiguous sense of safety, a lasting. The Lord gave this poem, which is called Let Me Get Home Before Dark, to Robertson McQuilkin when he was on a retreat. He and his wife had served 12 years as missionaries in Japan. His wife was 55 when the first signs of Alzheimer's began to appear. Robertson resigned from his position as president of Columbia Bible College and Seminary in order to care for his wife. During this time, he penned this poem, Let Me Get Home Before Dark, and he wrote... It was a slow dying for me to watch the vibrant, creative, articulate person I knew and loved gradually dimming out. His wife, Muriel, as the condition worsened, couldn't speak a coherent word for years. He loved her and cared for her in her silent world. Here's the poem. Let me get home before dark. It's sundown, Lord. The shadows of my life stretch back into the dimness of the years long spent. I fear not death, for that grim foe betrays himself at last, thrusting me forever into life, life with you, unsoiled and free. But I do fear, I fear the dark spectre may come too soon, or do I mean too late? that I should end before I finish, or finish but not well, that I should stain your honour, shame your name, grieve your loving heart. Few, they tell me, finish well. Lord, let me get home before dark. The darkness of a spirit grown mean and small, fruit shriveled on the vine, bitter to the taste of my companions. 
burden to be borne by those brave few who love me still. No, Lord, let the fruit grow lush and sweet, a joy to all who taste. Spirit sign of God at work, stronger, fuller, brighter at the end. Lord, let me get home before dark. The darkness of tattered gifts, rust locked, half spent or ill spent. A life that once was used of God, now set aside. Grief for glories gone, or fretting for a task God never gave. Mourning in the hollow chambers of memory, gazing on the faded banners of victories long gone, cannot I run well unto the end? Lord, let me get home before dark. The outer me decays, I do not fret or ask reprieve. The ebbing strength but weans me from Mother Earth and grows me up for heaven. I do not cling to shadows cast by immortality. I do not patch the scaffold lent to build the real, eternal me. I do not clutch about me my cocoon, vainly struggling to hold hostage a free spirit pressing to be born. But will I reach the gate in lingering pain, body distorted, grotesque? Or will it be a mind wandering, untethered among light fantasies or grim terrors? Of your grace, Father, I humbly ask, let me get home before dark. The Song of the Welsh Revival, 1904, sung by Hugh Pridey, Here is Love. Snippets. Hudson Taylor, founder of the China Inland Mission, always sent his first tithe of the year to a Jewish ministry in London the mild May mission to the Jews, received a cheque from him each year with a memo to the Jew first. In Albania in 2001, its international airport was named after Mother Teresa. G.K. Chesterton said, if there were no God, there would be no atheists. Every day in America, thousands of people ignore the scriptures and take back the marriage vows they spoke before God, their spouses and their friends. It was a mistake. I thought I loved him or her, but I was wrong. I know I said I do, but now I don't. Many people end their marriages with regret, but many do not. Far too many decide to break their marriage vows on the basis of convenience or preference. Bertrand Russell was a brilliant mathematician and scholar, but he rejected any notion of a personal God and throughout his life professed to be an atheist. Russell, who was orphaned in childhood, found his need for love satisfied by a relationship with an American Quaker named Alice Pearsall Smith. They were married in 1894. In 1901, he wrote, I went out bicycling one afternoon, and suddenly, as I was riding along a country road, I realised I no longer loved Alice. I had no idea until this moment that my love for her was even lessening. Alice was devastated and did all she could to cling to her husband, but there was no backpedalling. In 1911 they separated and they were divorced in 1921. Russell's subsequent romantic life was lurid and littered with marriages, breakups, divorces, infidelities and affairs. There are prices to pay when marriages end, economically, emotionally, spiritually and societally for both adults and children. In a recent Time magazine article, author Caitlin Flanagan wrote, There is no other single force causing as much measurable hardship and human misery in the country of America as the collapse of marriage. Earl Eichel Ivanhoe Ives, Big Rock Candy Mountain, Earl Ives. The Popori Show, 
a miscellaneous collection, a combination of incongruous things, a melange, a ragbag, omnium gatherum, an amalgam of things. Till next time, it's Derek Lindley wishing you every blessing and thanks for listening. <laughs>